Thank you, Brother Joe. Yes, a new man. Uh, it, it just, as he was test, giving testimony and about life being changed, and even lives at such a young age being changed, it just, um, I'm going to tell you this as a reminder, or it reminded me very quickly, um, I helped with uh, uh, giving Michelle, who's teaching the kids downstairs in Kid Zone there, uh, uh, their lesson, and Joe, for, for I believe it's Four, four or five weeks, um, their scripture verse, and I want to look it up really quick. I, in my head, it's 1 Corinthians 5 17, I believe. Um, a, a new creation, you're created new, the old has passed away. I believe that's the reference. I'm, I'm trying to do a round quick off my head, but it is about this new creation, this new change that takes place. And before I get into my uh, little uh, text of, of understanding here, um, last week, it's kind of cool because, you know, uh, Halloween is coming, and no, we're not doing a harvest festival, and, and that's okay, but they're learning, it's their, their lesson for four or five weeks is called the Pumpkin Patch Lessons, <laughs> and so last week, and so for five weeks, they're going to learn about what it means to be a, a, a new creation, have a changed life, as Joe was singing about, and with the first week, it was get the gunk out, and so <laughs> reference cutting open a pumpkin, and if, 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 has anybody ever stuck their hand in a pumpkin yeah. as a kid or as, as the adult, well, everyone, cover my pumpkin, cover it, so the adult has to, everyone's, you know, not, not all the time, because a lot of kids, here's what I've learned, slow down, as an adult, I've learned, you lay down more newspapers <laughs> as the kid who wants to pull the gunk out of the pumpkin, God comes in, this new creation, and cleans you out, this week they're doing glow. And they're, they're, they still do the, they're memorized. I'm telling you, kids memorize scriptures so fast and so well. So they're memorizing the new creation scripture. And then they also get another scripture with the lesson of the day. Their lesson of the day was in Matthew, where it is, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, what is it, what is it good for? Being trampled on by men. Or, and then you are the light of the world. And you are supposed to be this bright light to the world. I'm just paraphrasing. This is their scripture verse. They are, in fact, making the craft right now of the scripture verse, which is a jar filled with halfway filled with salt, and then a piece of paper or something on the salt. And then they take these markers and they're drawing. It's a glass jar, so they're coloring like like stained glass on the upper part, and they put a tea light in and. And on the cap goes the scripture verse, you are a new creation. So as a new creation, you are the saltiness of the earth. As a new creation, you are the light to the world and you've got to share it. That's what the kids are doing right now. Unless you're Elijah who's doing it. And I went down real quick to just make sure everything was uh, as needed, you know, because they, they're also doing games about light and stuff. And I just wanted to make sure she was on the money with it. And with that, Elijah, there's his thing, because they're going to do the crap. I explained it, right, to you? Papa, do we have an extra jar? I, jar, I want to keep bugs in it. <laughs> hey, that's a six-year-old boy right there. The light of the world, keeping bugs. <laughs> you know what, guys? There is a joy within our congregation. Uh, please learn that. Take it to heart. You are a part. I, some of you might not have known the Bacanis. Um, they were here worshiping with us when I came here 10 years ago. And uh, his heart was always passionate about this church. You ask Brother Bacani and, and Sister Bernie, this is our home church when we're not in the Philippines. This is our place. And so every time I go to something and I see a relative, that's what's brought to me. They love Culver City, Church of God. And so we are a light. Man, and in fact, our light, lightness and our saltiness of what has been brought up through this congregation, not just in kids, but in adults, it is not only with the school and the ministry, the Bacanis, it is also with Melody and her sex. We are touching many areas of, of the Philippines because of how we pour into people in this place. You should be filled with joy that you are a part of Culver City Church of God. 
that's the uh, announcement for t today, or what they call your station break, or whatever. <laughs> be, be proud and happy of who you are. Thank you, Brother Joe. I, last week, I hope, and I'm going to say this, I hope that you did well on forgiveness. I hope that you did well in showing compassion to people and mercy to people. I'm just reminding you because I don't just do a message that God's laid out in my heart just so you have it for one Sunday. It is a lifetime thing. Uh, you want to be new, changed, forgiveness, compassion, love, mercy, peace, gentleness. That's the spirit. That's all right because that's what's in you when you're a new creation. Yeah. So last week we were in Matthew and I'm back to Mark. And we were in chapter 4 in Mark. Going all the way down to the last story. All of chapter 4 is, if I'll just help you out, was the, the, the farmer with the seeds, throwing it on the ground that was hard, and one was thorny, and one was uh, 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 rocky, and got the seed eaten, and one was really good soil. And there was the other parables, because Jesus was telling us in Mark chapter 4, he teaches in parables, and then there's understanding that comes with it. We know in chapter 4 that sometimes the disciples had to go on the sideline and go, okay, uh, we're not really getting that parable. And Jesus is like, okay, let me explain the parable. Especially this one. It was so easy. It's almost like, can I say it this way? Let me, I'm going to say it this way. Jesus is like, you should understand this. So this is why I'm telling you the simple meaning of the parables. Chapter 4 was filled with parables, except for this story found at the very bottom of your chapter, uh, verses 35 through 41. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? If you have a King James Version or anything like that, it is, Do, thy, do, do thou carest not? <laughs> exclamation point! Exclamation point! When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence! Be still, or be quiet. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Closing out chapter 4. I'm going to very, very quickly, we have communion today, and I'm not going quickly because you go, wow, it all tied in. Wow. But can okay, I scare you real quick? Pull out your pencils. Okay, because I always tell you, underline, hold it up your Bible. Make sure you take notes, because I'm going to say it this time. Take notes. Number eight. I have eight points. You're like, eight points. The dude only has like 15 minutes. He goes about five. He has about 20 minutes. Eight points. Yes. In such a short little scripture? Yes. Are you ready? I'm giving you time to grab those pencils. Pens. In the scriptures of this story, did you notice, and mine was in parentheses, and so it made me really look, am I really seeing this? Because sometimes you hear the story at the end, the waves came and the boat was about to sink, hey, and we know the story, but it caught my eye like this, that others followed the disciples and the Savior's boat. It wasn't just one boat that went across the sea. There was these other boats that were following. Think about it this way. Jesus is teaching and teaching and teaching and more and more crowds are coming in and, and instead of pressing upon him as these crowds are, he, remember he got in the boat? I'm going to teach from the boat. That way I can at least do what i got to say. And I can teach these people. So he's in the boat, teaching and teaching and teaching. And, and I was like, you know what, guys? Whew, it's done. Let's go to the other side. And so all those people that were there hearing the teaching were like this. I, I, it's a movie in my head. Here's this tiny boat that, that Jesus is teaching. 
teaching him. And the, and the disciples get in. Let's go to the other side. Okay, Jesus. They start grabbing the horse. Let's go to the other side. And all those other people are like, hey, let's go. There's something about this man that's teaching us. Let's follow along. They're just going to the other side of the lake. Let's get in our boats and we'll follow him. Others followed the Savior and the disciples. And I say this in these eight points. Could we realize for ourselves that at some point in time in our life, uh, uh, Joe actually gave testimony to his own life, was an other. You were in an, another boat. You were hearing the Savior's words. You're, you're hearing your friends tell you about this person, Jesus Christ, who died for you to save you and to change your life. And so we are in those other boats with curiosity. I'm going to just check it out. He's going over to the other side. You know what? I'm still interested. We get in the other boats to follow after the Savior, to just kind of maybe see and hear. So we're just kind of not quite a follower of Jesus Christ, but we're one who's curious about it. And this, I'm just telling you, this, this is how sometimes lives change. Sometimes it's dramatic. Bam! They're changed. You know, I believe in the, the, the Holy Spirit has just magnified everything. I understand and I'm saved. And then there's others that come week after week kind of curious. I'm in that other boat. I'm listening. I'm not quite grasping it yet. But maybe, point number two, I like this one. Jesus fell asleep in the boat. Man, I don't know about you guys, but if I do a Sunday morning service, I'm just going to tell you real quick, I get up very early. I've already prepared. I get up early. There's still stuff in there. I'm just making sure, making sure. I'm doing all sorts of things. I'm helping out. I'm letting other people help. There's just so you know, there's volunteers in the kitchen in the morning. And, and so, but I'm still up early doing all this stuff. And then I get up here. And I don't know about see for me, guys, I know you go, oh, he's all excited. I'm telling you what, the spirit just moves in me so much. The adrenaline is so high in what God has. And so then I walk away, and then I, there's other things to an example is the kids want to go to the park right next to us because it's, it's uh, Marina Del Rey Day. We might get some free pizza and some free stuff out of it. So let's go. They have stuff for everything. It's a real exciting time for free in the park. Let's go do that. And so, for, and then for me personally, I'm telling my day, then I know that I'm a friend of mine, Pastor Chris Reed, who is uh, being installed as a new pastor at, at College Park. Today's their celebration. So I'm going to go down there and let's. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit in a service down there and, and they'll be preaching and, and, and it'll be exciting. And then there's other things on my mind. I'm gonna just tell you, do I'm trying to fix my my my, my dryer. Oh, uh. and so it's like one more thing added, and this is what I know. If I sit in the rocking chair, <laughs> pretending like to read the newspaper, there will be pages that will not get turned. Because it'll, it'll be just because you have all this, it eventually gets that Miller watching TV attitude. Your eyes closed and the TV's on. <laughs> In this beautiful story, Jesus worked. I say worked. He taught, taught. And when he was done, he laid in a boat and laid down on a cushion for his head and fell asleep. <laughs> Two things. We have a Savior who knows everything and has no fear. In a small boat and going across the, the, this little lake. I, he, he's like some people. Ready? Yeah, let's go to the other side of the boat, the, the other side of the, the lake over there. Um, while you guys are rowing, I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> Which is okay. But Jesus lays down with no fear. Jesus lays down. If you're taking notes and wanting to understand something, a time of rest. Wow. Yeah. Ah, the Savior lays down for rest. Number three, do you remember the, the first point was I just gave you a little while ago? Others were in other boats, right? Yeah, right. And they were following along, following the boat. Here's the Savior. Here's the other boats coming in. You know, however many it was that gathered and got their boat. You know, it was like, oh, I got a boat and I'm following. There's a Savior. Let's make, we're not going to do our own course to the other side. We're going to follow that boat. So when he lands, we land where he lands. And we hear more stuff. 
others are following, meant this. They were in the same windstorm that came and hit the master's boat. You can't buy it. They're in the same lake. They're following the same boat. That same windstorm came down. It's not like a cartoon where, okay, God just made the windstorm go on just their boat. <laughs> and, 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 and the waves only, only rocked and filled the boat of their boat. No, they were in the same predicament that was the master ship and the disciples' boat. They were in the same thing when the windstorm came down. And those, so I'm looking at this story. Seasoned fishermen are kind of freaking out a little bit. The waves are filling this boat. We're probably going to drown. We got the non-fishermen who think we're going to drown for sure. And all of a sudden, they're stirring up the emotion. We're probably going to drown. Even seasoned fishermen are going to go, whoa, I don't, I don't know what to do. Wake up the master. These, can you imagine this? At least they had the master in the boat. These other boats didn't have the master in the boat, but they still had the same waves crashing in on them. They still had the same things coming up and overtaking them in the other boats, possibly causing them the same kind of fear. And I will say this, even today, we are still in, quote, the other boats. Or, we're in the boat with the Savior also. Because, yeah. can I know this? Even with the boat with the Savior, the water still came in. The wind still came around them. Even though they were with the Savior. This, this, this is beautiful. Because what that tells me is that, you know what? That at this point in time, there's things that come up against us and, and, and it's going to overtake us a little bit. It's going to be really rough, possibly. And it happened to even those that were the curious ones in the other world. Point number four. Point number four. I have brutalized myself with this note, too. Okay? In our own problems, and I made that really bold, in our own problems, and the reason I made that bold, our own problems, is because I added this. It is a selfish, selfish problem. How do you mean that, Pastor? I mean it just like this. It is my problem. I'm being overtaken. I don't care about your problem right now. I have a difficulty. It is a selfish problem that I have. It is a selfish over... The, the water is filling the boat. I'm about to go down. You at least have a life raft. That's how we look at it. It's not about other people's problems. It's my own selfish problem. And in my own selfish problem, I can utter the ridiculous statement. Are you ready? There's a ridiculous statement in this scripture? Yes. In my thought process, it is a ridiculous statement. For the King James Version, carest thou not? No. Oh. In the version I read, Jesus, Jesus, wake up. They're shouting, so it's okay if I shout a little. Jesus, wake up. We're taking out water. Don't you care that we're going to drown? Ridiculous statement. Let me put it in terms of, man, this is my problem right here. I, I can't handle that. This is my problem right here. Now i got two problems. I, I'm being, and, and you know what? We, we talk about, or we should talk about, uh, mental states within within uh, the congregations and within, I say congregations, because a, a, a mental problem happens to a lot of people. D -d Depression happens to a lot of people, including those in the boat with the Savior. Something happens to people because it starts overtaking them. These are all coming upon them. They become their problem, and they utter a ridiculous statement. Jesus, you do not even care about me. Why do I say it's ridiculous? Of course God cares. He knows everything about what you're going through. And He cares. Of course Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cares about every problem you have. Of course the Holy Spirit, which was given to you upon following Him, cares about your problem, about your anxieties, about your depression, about your joy. In fact, the Holy Spirit is so much a part of you that it is every facet of your life. And it cares about the 
this thing that you started looking at scripture in such a way love casts out fear. And I know people, people are going to go off theological and it means this. You know what? I don't care what you say it means. In my heart, in my pain, in my anxiety, in my fear, God's love casts it out. Wow. It will never, ever overtake me. If you turn on a Christian radio station, five out of ten songs, more than likely, because they usually play the same ten over and over, five out of ten songs, just like every other radio station, has a song or a line about how God casts out fear. Fear has no control over you. How you will never let fear overtake you because of God. These are how the songs go. They're in your head, and that's how you follow along with the Spirit because He casts out fear. Our problems will not overtake us. Number five, it is okay to have fear, ready, when it points to the Savior. Hallelujah. They're in the boat, right? There's the Savior right there. We're going to drown. We're going to drown. And so fear points to the Savior, and they ask him, do you care? It's their way of saying, God, help us. Jesus, do what you can. Help us. We saw you heal the guy over there. We saw you cast out a demon over here. You can help us. Save us. Love, excuse me, fear points us to the Savior, and it always should. Always should. I, I, in my notes, I said this to myself for a moment. Man, I almost feel sorry for those in the other boat. Because Jesus is in this boat. <laughs> and, and their boat might be sinking, but I might swim over to the other sinking boat. At least that's who the Savior is. It points, fear points to the Savior. Number six. Verse 39. Be quiet. Be silent. Those words right there, they mirror the same words. See, we're only in chapter four. We're ending chapter four. In chapter one, when the demons came, when the, the uh, unclean spirit people came up to Jesus and was rattling off their mouth, Jesus said those same words. Be quiet. That's right. The sea is raging. Jesus says, be quiet. He gets up and says, be quiet. In those words, think about it, from chapter 1 to chapter 4, in the words where he's telling things to be quiet, where he's telling the, whole, the spirits to be come out, be quiet, say nothing. When he's doing this, when he says to the raging sea that's filling up their boat, be silent, be at peace. Jesus is demonstrating that he is the divine, almighty, all-powerful, all-in-control of things that are spiritual and things that are of the natural elements. So if you have any question of who God is, it is he is God of everything. That's right. It shows as he, and that can, this is the problem with the disciples. He demonstrated the demonic uh, spirits were quiet. The waves immediately stopped and were calm. Jesus is not just standing up on a pulpit going, I think you need to be quiet. And this <laughs> will happen if you are quiet. No, he, he showed, he showed his divinity. Jesus is showing us that he is the maker of the great calm. Wow. Yes. We saw it in the, in the Old Testament readings. The Old Testament readings had, if you, if you really follow along, it's like, oh, there's some things where nature was kind of wreaking havoc, and the nations, as in people, were wreaking havoc. And in all of the havoc, may I say this, because there was some joy that was in that with those verses. You had to really pay attention. In all of the havoc over here, it is still that God is still God. Yeah. So even in our troubles, He's still God. Yeah. Number seven, I'm almost done, guys. Number seven, verse verse forty. Do you not have? Do you do you, do you not yet have faith? Do you yet not have faith? 
Jesus made it clear by all the things that they have seen. And these, let's take Mark. These four short chapters, Jesus showed them who he was in his divine divinity, who he was as the Son of God, who he was with all authority. Jesus showed all these disciples that are in this boat that's going under. He showed them everything. And yet, they were struggling to recognize that he is the divine. He asked them the question in a way, you've got to have faith. Don't you have it yet? That same question is for us today too. Do you have that faith? Yes. Number eight, my last one, number eight. This is the who we are. Verse 41, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the winds and the waves obey him. I'm going to say, when I say terrified, it is the wow factor. They were in deep awe of what had just happened. They were in deep awe of a man who did what he did. Because, it, think about it, Jesus did not skip a step. He taught, 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 taught. He's in the book after teaching. He lays down and goes to sleep. And after he goes to sleep, he's rattled by the shoulder. Wake up! Gonna drown, don't you care? And he does that, Mr. B. He gets up, be quiet, be silent, not to the disciples, but to the waves. Be quiet, be silent. Then he goes into the teaching mode. Hey, don't you have faith yet? He doesn't skip a beat. And when they start to see that he doesn't skip a beat, then you understand, yeah, this is the guy who has control of everything. Savior, 
Let us stand before we take communion. Hallelujah. God, oh, you we, we are always in your presence, and we worship and thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, for if I can metaphorically say, being with us in the boat. God, we give up ourselves because you died on the cross for us. If there is someone here this morning that does not know that joy, they might be in the other boats, just kind of testing the waters and seeing God. Help us to continue to be the ones that we take communion to proclaim what you did dying on the cross for us. That you raised and that you give us your Holy Spirit and that you are in all things and bring great calm. If there's someone here that does not know that, God, may they ask just that simple thing. God, please forgive me for not having that kind of a relationship with you, for not uh, giving up everything for you, God, to follow you. May my boat no longer be a following boat. God, may I be one that takes the steps with you. Thank you for dying for me and that forgiveness. Help us in these moments, God, to slow down and recognize what you've done as we are about to take communion after this song. We give it to you following what you've done for us. In Jesus' name.